Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 31, we're going to take a look at the Svetlana 6550 and how it sounded with the Wilsonton R8 amp. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Well, sometimes patience pays off. I've wanted to bring in the Svetlana 6550 for a long time, but I've never found enough vintage tubes to make it work. Now why in the heck would I need a whole bunch? Well, the problem with many high output power tubes, like the KT88 and the 6550, is how variable they are. In order to match up four nice quads and a bunch of pairs, I needed to buy almost 40 tubes. Okay, but how did they sound? Well, in short, really, really good. In fact, great. Let's do a mini review, starting with a quick look at the tube. Now, one thing I want to make sure, let's get the light up here for us, that you see is that there are different series. A lot of tubes have series. And right here you see 6550C, so that's C series. There's a B series that's out there. In fact, it's all over the place. And the B series had problems with reliability. And I suspect what happened is a lot of it was just held in warehouses when they discovered that they had a problem. And now it's finding its way into the marketplace. C-Series fixed those problems and has been a very reliable tube. So look at the beautiful logo at the top. We've got a winged C. Now you'd wonder what the heck is C? Svetlana starts with an S. Well, C in the Russian alphabet is actually RS in the West. So there you go. And this is the vintage Svetlana made in St. Petersburg. And there's actually a reissue that is made in the old reflector factory. Um, in Saratov, Russia, by the New York company, the huge New York company, New Sensor. New Sensor makes just an incredible array of quasi reissue relabeled stuff. So they have they own the mother name, they own um, the Wing C logo, they own uh, Gold Lion, um, you name it. Um, Anyways, uh, their main traditional brand name that they did use uh, for a long time was Electroharmonix, which is probably how you'd know them by. Anyways, let's take a look at the plate structure. So, let's start at the bottom. We have a nice metal base, which is really common with the KT88 types, and this, of course, is a 6550, uh, which is in the same family. These are um, take a look at the plate, see how it's shaped? These are beam-powered tetrodes. So the, the beam-powered part is not an electrical thing. Well, it is an electrical thing, but it's not a wiring thing. What it is is a physical forming of the plates and how everything is lined up inside. And it focuses the electrons into a beam, hence beam-powered. Yeah? And, of course, that increases uh, efficiency and that increases power or power potential. So we've got we've got our beam-shaped plates with three large rectangular openings, and if you look carefully through this in high def, you can see the grid windings. See that? Isn't that neat? Now, these tubes, the KT88, the K is kinkless, and that has to do with actually how the output of the tube appears um, electrically on a scope. Um, there's actually a physical kink in the output of the pre-kinkless uh, design innovation. And to get these tubes kinkless, 
the 6550, the KT88, the KT77. Um, they had to come up with a uh, unique way of winding all of these grids. And I believe what they did was they came up with a way of spacing it and winding them all at the same time. That's really where the work is, is getting that grid winding around the cathode, which sits around the heater. <laughs> I mean, it looks fairly easy on the outside, but if you deconstruct the tube, it's actually fairly complex. Okay, so that's our plate and all our internals. Look at these interesting little punch outs, these little holes along the edge of the plate. Normally punch outs like that would be weld points, but in this case, I think they're actually just expansion slots of some sort. Or maybe they're to facilitate construction. The welds are right on the, the edge of the plate. Can you see them? There's one, there's another one, there's another. When you see a welded plate, that's often a really good indication of high quality, um, higher tech manufacturing. It's a lot, I think it's a lot cheaper, quicker, old school to just punch a bunch of rivets. Um, and in fact, we were looking at the Electroharmonix 6550, which is a similar tube. Um, last week, I think, recently anyways, and it's got some really, it's, they're nicely done rivets. I wish I had one here for you, but I don't think there's one handy. Anyways, uh, but they're pretty, pretty ugly. Um, now, moving up, we've got a fairly unique bar. You see this big U-shaped bar that comes across the top here? And I think that's just an extension of this whole uh, reinforcing rod that comes up. It just goes up, cross, and down. But mounted on it are two fairly large offset saucer getters, which gives us, of course, a nice big chrome dome. Okay. But how did they sound? Bass was very good. Plus, plus. In fact, let's just call it excellent. I don't like to use that word very often, but I think in this case it's warranted. Now, not just bass, but percussion overall was outstanding. Very detailed, nice tone, clarity and punch. But I don't think it was forward. Just neutral and really well done. The, the reason why I've extended the description to include percussion is because not all percussion is in the bass. Some of it can be well into the mid-range. And of course, cymbals, triangles, etc. go right up into the high treble. Mid-range was crisp, clean, and clear, or the three C's, as I like to say, with a nice bit of warmth. Now, not warm like a vintage Mullard EO34 warm, or as some on online writers are describing as mid-range blue. Warm for a KT88 type which is what the 6550 is. Back in the day, it may have had different enough specs to get around the patent rules, but today those patents have long expired. So now 6550s and KT88s are pretty much the same tube, or at least very close cousins. Treble was good plus, crisp, clean, and clear. In fact, the bass and mid-range are so good Maybe the treble is having trouble showing off its stuff, when the rest of the music spectrum is sounding so good. With excellent detail and stereo image comes a really nice soundstage. In fact, the best soundstage, or one of the best soundstages I've ever heard from either an EL34 or KT88 type. In case you didn't get it, I was impressed with this too. Now, in my listening tests, I played through my standard tracks and listened, listened to them right to the end, which only happens when I'm enjoying what I'm hearing. Then I put on Nick Mason's Magnus Opus, a saucer full of secrets, live at the roundhouse, and it opens with a vintage freakout astronomy domine. And wow, this well-recorded live show sounded great with the Svets. Lots of detail and punch. Next, I tried one of my favorite modern singers, Nora Jones, and her live album, Till We Meet Again, which opens with Cold, Cold Heart. What a title! 
and one of her many great songs. And again, the 6550s showed off this well-recorded album, and the lovely mid-range really showed off Nora Jones's unique and very captivating voice. Okay, a lot of interesting tubes came in this week. Let's have a quick look at some of them. I was lucky enough to find some more vintage Svets um, EL34s and it's not normal to find nice original boxes. It's It just isn't folks, the, especially Russian boxes. The old stock, new old stock sits in warehouses, uh, sits in basements probably, sits in closets, who knows where it sits. Um, a lot of the mill spec tubes, of course, are sitting in military um, warehouses. And I have a feeling uh, prioritizing um, humidity, dampness, uh, roof leaks um, just doesn't happen. So a lot of the boxes are probably discarded uh, right away. And of course, luckily, tubes are sealed. And as a result, um, you may get a little bit of you can't see it on this tube. Well, maybe you can. There's a little bit of corrosion on the base here or some junk. You'll see, on, particularly on the metal bases, the metal is susceptible to a little bit of that, especially if it was sitting shipboard because uh, salt air is very corrosive. Um, so inside the tube, the electronics are perfectly safe, which is why tubes are so long lived, of course. If the vacuum is been maintained and the gettering is surviving, because the guttering helps maintain a perfect vacuum, or it's a near perfect vacuum. Um, we will see some corrosion on the pins and here, but with any luck, uh, it's not too bad. And of course, they don't make vintage tubes anymore, so what we have is what we have. That's It's a finite inventory. Unless somebody can shift dimensions and find another existence in which there's, there's another line of tubes to drag back, that, this is it. These are the tubes we have. So anyways, that was a real treat. Um, that'll top up my inventory of the uh, Svetlana EL34s, which are one of my favorite um, favorite EL34s, vintage EL34s. What else came in? Oh, a whole bunch of really nice testing Sylvania 6SN7 GTBs. Now, I sell a lot of these. I keep a lot in inventory so that I can come up with some nice close match pairs. Sometimes I get orders for quads and it depends on what week it is. Some weeks I can do a quad really easily. Like right now I have a lot of inventory of GTAs and GTBs so I can match up quads fairly easily for at least another week. Um, but anyways, these came in. They're really clean. They test really strong. Some of them are really, look at that. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm calling these used. I'm putting them in, I think I've got these in as used. Yeah, I think so. Um, but they're looking awfully close to new old stock, aren't they? I mean, look, if you wanna know, look at the pins and look at the base. The print often just gets wiped off as, you know, these tubes become 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. Even sometimes the label on the plastic is fragile and it rubs off as well. Sometimes the tops stay well and sometimes they don't. And this issue of the Sylvanias, the tops were all solid. Uh, mind you, the tubes are really, they're really in good shape. Anyways, uh, a lot more of those in the inventory. One of my favorite 6SN7s. Oh, and I saved the best to last. I didn't find too many of these. But these are some more Sylvanias. This is a 6SN7 GTB, but it's an FAA. Now what the heck is that? That is, I believe, the American uh, Federal Aviation Authority. So these tubes were uh, bulk ordered, probably. Uh, we have a date. No, they were packed in November of 69, so they were probably made in 1969. And they were probably bulk ordered for um, either aircraft use or most likely for airport facility use. And the FAA or any aviation spec whatsoever, doesn't matter whose it is, is going to be high and it's going to be tight. So let's just pull one out and have a look. 
So it's not surprising. We've got our sections are 94 and 94. They're bang on. They're not all that good, but most of them are very tight. And of course, they're, there's new old stock. Um, so it um, it's not surprising that they're they're testing nice and high. Um, and the thing about any any tube that goes into medical use, that goes into um, military use, that goes into aviation use, is that almost certainly what Sylvania and other manufacturers did is that they selected the tubes off of the main assembly line. So what they did was they tested for certain parameters. And those parameters will work for airplanes, they'll work for medical equipment, uh, they'll work for, you know, guidance systems in the military. And we, as audiophiles, we benefit from those parameters because we can't help but benefit from tubes with tighter specifications or high testing tighter specifications. And who knows what the other requirements were. Anyways, these are lovely and they're in the store. Well, that was fun. And if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes for you. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if you spend $150 after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.